Okay. I think、uh, we are live now, so let's get yeah, started. Yeah, yeah. So good afternoon, everyone.、Uh, good morning to our friends in Europe. So I'm not sure whether anybody would join us、uh, from America at this point in time, but、uh, a very warm welcome to all. My name is Yi. I'm moderating this session. I'm co-founder of、uh, Mawatech. So we are an international connectivity provider to serve telecommunication companies and、uh, internet players regarding their international network demand. We also facilitate manage operator partnerships. So our panel today is on the future of manufacturing efficiency across Asia. Let me just、uh, probably simply read out the agenda here. In the past, Asia economic growth has been dominated by its low wage status. In the future. With a broad demographic decline forecast, Asia firms must adopt labor-efficient processes and make a huge number of workforce redundant. How disruptive will this be? Who will supplement the loss of workers' wages? The firms, the governments, or both? Are there any global exemplars of massive social support mechanism? So we have a great speakers today, and、um, from different regions and also different sectors.、Yeah? Without further ado, I will just hand over to them to let themselves introduce. So I have no thought about any specific order. Maybe we just start with、uh, your geographical distance and、uh, go to India first.、Yeah. Start with you, Gary. Would you please、uh, share a few words about yourself? Okay.、Uh, my name is Girish Pagar. Sorry, was it to me? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Here, Jesse Matias joined. Hi, we just. Yeah, I apologize for the delay.、Uh, we had an electricity problem. Basically, the electricity was cut off, which is highly unfortunate in that situation. It's good morning, everyone from my side. From you. No problem. We just joined in time. Yeah, we just start with the Girish with your duction. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, this is Girish Bagatir,、uh, and、uh, and I have been. Involved in the my main forte has been in bridging technology bridges between India and more Europe, most specifically from Italy. For the last ten, fifteen, twelve years that I've been doing this, I've connected over forty European companies to the India opportunity. Much many of them have been in the setting up manufacturing facilities here, so we are aware of what's happening in the manufacturing efficiencies and inefficiencies as we go along. In terms of what it does it take, and more so post-pandemic, there has been、uh, a real change in taking place, which we will discuss、uh, later on. Before that, my career comes from、uh, from, from financial services background,、uh, leading with the leading institutions of India and the rest of the world. So I look forward to my contributions coming from the grassroots of what's happening between Europe and India and the manufacturing sphere here. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, Girish. Yeah. So, Matthias, can we now move to you? If it's all right with you. Sure, absolutely. <laughs>、uh, my name is Matthias Ernst. I'm the founder and CEO of the Sensor Futura International in the United States. I'm、uh, currently in Lisbon, Portugal.、Um, we have an advisory company, and we have a participation participation company for our own business, our own family.、Um, We look into things from biotech, circular economy on plastic, to fintech mobility, and also the educational side,、uh, doing master degrees.、Uh, on the future of manufacturing efficiency across Asia, I would like to give my input、um, on the way how change management and transformation is perceived. At least、uh, I'm German from from、uh, within Germany and also Europe, but I like to keep it on a on a really global scale. And what I truly believe needs to be changed because otherwise the change is not going to happen. We I'm also、uh, my,、uh, a fellow of the family firm Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. So we have access to global leading families around the globe, and we also、um, help、uh, the entrepreneurship wherever we can because it's the essential tool. To make this change happen, fantastic! Thank you, Martin. Look forward to your contribution. You. Yeah. So, Michael, I think it's your turn now. Can you please also share a few words about yourself? Thank you. Thank you, Lee, and、uh, really happy to see our friends again、uh, joining the Horus Asia meeting.、Uh, this is Michael Lee. Uh, I'm an、uh, MIT graduate uh, and uh, spent almost. Twenty years in the United States and now working in China, 
uh, focus on digital transformation for manufacturing sectors. Um, in the past uh, few years, um, since I joined the Horizon uh, community, uh, we have seen tremendous growth in digital transformation in China. Uh, even through the pandemic area, uh, in, uh, last year we see tremendous uh, interest and uh, implementation in China. So I'd like to draw our panelists together today to share <coughs> what we have experienced in China uh, during this uh, tremendous important time. Thank you, Michael. So last but not least, uh, we have Peter from Singapore, same as me, even though Peter is in Switzerland now. So stage is yours, Peter. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, um, I'm Peter Peer. I'm a CEO of Asia Pacific for OMIA since more than a decade. And um, OMIA is a, is a family business, about $4 billion uh, um, sales. We are the largest calcium carbonate manufacturer worldwide. We have about more than 180 factories in 56 countries. I'm, I'm running Asia Pacific um, in 14 Asian countries with about 55 <laughs> and 20 to 30 um, quarries. And uh, on top of it, we also have a large distribution business, chemical distribution business, which is kind of a cross-selling in the market segments of calcium carbonate as a filler for, for construction, consumer goods, um, uh, agriculture, and, uh, and polymer. Um, having, having the whole region as manufacturing, and also trading and distribution, uh, we can see a lot of varieties and differences between the different countries going from east to west. Um, we have um, highly developed countries like Korea, Japan, Australia, and um, happy to share some, some insights of, um, of what we do in Asia. Thank you, Peter. I'm excited to hear from, from your side. I think we have um, just mentioned at the beginning the broad demographic decline forecast drives uh, Asia firms to adopt a labor efficiency process. But also, some of you mentioned, uh, especially now the pandemic, has led to an accelerated digital transformation in many companies. So basically, also speed up this process. And this all have an impact and make actually the workforce redundant. So from your perspective, uh, how disruptive you think uh, this uh, transformation process going to be, especially on the low-wage workers? So, Matthias, would you be okay to start uh, with you first? To Absolutely. share your thoughts on that? Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, mm. So thank you. Um, I would like to start with the that what we all learned, that we have change management, that we have transition, that we all know we have to have a transition. We have mega trends with sustainability, digitalization, just to name two. But the question is, um, being pragmatic, you are the CEO of a company. You, you want to do it. You have passion for it. You understand it. You, you want to learn. You want to do the next things. That's one thing. But you need to have your workforce with you. Because otherwise, if you cannot have them behind you, you will not succeed. And uh, the big question is, it, the old models, how we said, okay, put, uh, to increase the productivity, to be more efficient, to have all the tools that we learned, they are important because it's a day-to-day -day business, but forward-looking, what is missing? And I think one of the missing tools is that most of this transition is simply not working. Because when you look, there is a very interesting study from Porsche Consulting that when they did in Germany, they said, well, actually 20% only, only 20% of all the, the papers are there, the strategy papers are there, everything is there. But the question is, will they succeed? And the answer is simply no. It's just 20%. And this is really not a great result. So what is the reason for that? And I think uh, one of the key points is, Everyone is selfish. So it sounds very negative what I'm saying, but mm -hmm. everyone also on this panel and on this conference, when you are in a company, you want to grow, you want to do something. Um, I would assume that most of the people want to do something good for them, that they are well and that the families are well and that they can grow. So they need to have a learning path, but they need to know where the company is going and what the transition actually means for them personally. Now, this comes to the point of leadership where 
the leaders of the companies need to communicate very well where they are going, what they're going to do, what will happen to the employees. Because at the moment they understand that, they will follow to a certain extent. You can give them hard numbers, as many as you wish, and, uh, but they will forget the numbers at a certain point. You can hammer them in their head for 10, 20, 30, 40 times, it might happen, and say, okay, now we need to go, now we need... Uh, it's a fear factor that we don't want. So you need to really engage them by saying, look, it's, that's what we have to do. This is the transformation we need to do in order to survive or to grow, to, to, to be good in the competition. That means you need to improve what? Either they are not willing to follow the employees or they are not skilled enough to do that. So even if they are willing to do that, they are maybe not skilled enough to do that for the future. So it means when we have a transformational change, we need to qualify them for the future. And this lack of skills is a decisive factor for competitiveness, efficiency as a consequence. Because if you lose the workforce and they are not skilled, uh, skilled enough, you can be the best CEO in the leadership and you can do whatever you want. This is the failure maybe why you don't succeed. Hmm. Very interesting view of Matthias. So quite, um, I think the, the leadership management also share the passion, the communication. Thank you very much, Matthias. Okay. Girish, yeah. And I think India is one of the key manufacturing countries. At the same time, India is also the technology hub. I think uh, it's uh, currently drives massively the digital transformation. So how is your observation in here, in this context, the impact on the low-wage workers, the whole transformation. Yeah. Can you please share with us? Hmm? Okay, let me put this into a context. Uh, you know, India is ad advent into manufacturing is a relatively recent phenomenon as compared to the rest of the developed world or European world. Okay, the real thrust in manufacturing came with this government when uh, our pre present <coughs> prime minister or made an appeal to make in India and inviting foreign companies to manufacture in India. So as a result of that, so in the past, there has not been an entrepreneur's mindset to train the labor, to skill the labor, to employ them. They were basically serving, you know, we were basically not in the manufacturing space very substantially as we are making the efforts now. So now what is happening is, Okay, two, three things are unfolding. Okay, yes, we have the, we are bringing in the technologies as the foreign people come and establish their manufacturing hubs or their ancillary hubs here. The technologies are coming in by default. But what is also happening is that when these technologies come in, our then they, they come in with a joint venture or will come in with the CEO, an Indian CEO or an Indian production head. The mindset of to skill the labor, the mindset of improving the labor's productivity is just not there. The mindset still is in many companies to use contract workers, you know, not to have people on their own payroll, etc. So this and we have I faced this situation in one particular joint venture we did. And I changed there, forced a change there that, listen, we got to get rid of this this, you know, uh, uh, thought process issue, which was a relic of the past and go ahead and put people on the payroll. If you don't get people the sense of security, the sense, how are you going to extract oil? How are you going to extract productivity? So if there is a divide between I'm an employer and you are the employee and I can make and, you know, seek you when I want to and I dismiss you when I want to, there is no then an incentive for the person to stay committed to you, learn the new technology is zero. So I think we have to make an effort and now the entrepreneurs are realizing and are making those efforts okay, in bringing people on the payroll and when they come on the payroll, then what happens is the, the, the training comes in by default because you don't train a person who is not on a payroll. So the training comes in the foreign company comes in and says, hey, I want to strain the labor. They must work according to <laughs> They work according to my production processes. Okay, so that, that training and that method is not just at the, at the workforce level. It's actually having at the management level as well. So these changes are taking place in terms of, uh, you know, so what we really see is the leadership, as, as, as Matthias said, the leadership needs to transform themselves. New move away from the new mindset. Second thing that is noticing is, you see, as India wants to come up on the cusp of manufacturing scale, you need to have much severe and much more automation. 
And when you deal in much more automation, by definition, we are not saying, we are saying we lead less number of people, but more trained people. Okay, now just to give you an illustration, one, dollar, one million euro dollar of investment in an Indian industry, in a large industry, generates just about seven to eight jobs. <clears throat> the same million dollar invested in a, a SME industry generates a hundred multiple, it generates 700 jobs. The same one million dollar invested in a micro company generates another hundred multiple and it creates 70,000 jobs. So we also have a challenge of creating jobs. We don't just have a challenge of just building the workforce and industry. We get need an improvement. There's a, there's a social self up there. So the I think so the effort has to be from a from a from a uh, establishment point of view has to be to make the MSMEs the small and medium companies the micro companies much more enabled and who are more reliant on the labor. Now there training becomes an even more important aspect because they are not used to. So and their training has to be a little different. Unfortunately, our education system is not well geared. Our education system needs to be, and is getting now, needs to be realigned with the industrial practices, needs to follow the best practices around in the world, and therefore the emphasis on vocational education. Because at that bottom level, vocational education, we don't need engineers. We don't, mm -hmm. we need vocationally trained people. So today we have very limited opportunities on the vocational training. So as we look at it, as I see it from the happening in the industry point of view, the the manufacturing is on the takeoff. There is no doubt on that more and more. The the need to change the entrepreneur mindset in and the manager's mindset, management mindset in, in investing in training. And that's not a cost, but that's an investment. They need to understand that in the training of the workforce. They need to bring them up with the latest, reskill them. As Matthias said, you know, in terms of the new technologies that are being adopted. At the same time, we need to touch base a social fabric of improving the vocational education available in India. Only then and only then we will be able to produce the right workforce for the right for the industry and which in itself is changing according to changing technologies. So it's 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 happening, but the challenges are far and uh, far greater. Yeah. Thanks, Girish. It's very, very insightful. Also you mentioned uh, quite a lot of uh, important aspects yes, like the change of mindset on the leadership side. As Matthias mentioned, right. also the risk of the trainings, but also the adopt uh, the change of the education system. I thought we will discuss more about this later. So, Michael, now come to you. Your business uh, focus on Industry 4.0. I think this is the driving force on the whole uh, manufacturing efficiency. How how is uh, your perspective here? What are the disruptions, the impacts you see on the workforces? Yes, let, let me share uh, some uh, interesting, good, uh, very uh, exciting news. Actually, we just had a uh, uh, 40 years new uh, steel mill factory in China. Uh, we helped them to implement uh, their uh, digital system. Uh, employees, some of them have been with the company for many years uh, with only uh, multiple education, are able to use the program uh, using the digital devices and eventually all department come together producing their first all digital uh, QA uh, qualification uh, certificate for their product uh, without any human input. So they have production information, they have uh, lab tests, they have uh, customer information all uh, flowing smoothly through their system and producing this uh, verifiable uh, certificate. Uh, it's uh, really amazing to see this happening, uh, considering people doesn't have a lot of uh, training in computer science or digital technologies. Um, this is happening in China. Uh, so one major driving force is uh, digital technology is penetrating the human, everybody's life like with using WeChat, using um, a lot of existing technologies, e-payments, these are everyday technology they are using. Uh, so the uh, digital transformation technology adapts. Actually, the factory is uh, behind the curve. 
uh, compared to consumer technology adoption. And uh, once you have a technology in the factory, people are actually familiar with it. They know how to use it. So it's not a, a major hurdle for them to use technology. And from what we see on the ground is 90% of the factories want digital transformation, but actually only about 10% of company actually doing that. So the company actually doing that, actually not reducing their workers, they're actually increasing to do more business, driving efficiency, uh, having more production because they are reducing the redundancy and the repetitive works of uh, data entering, data collection, data verification, uh, all these works. So they are able, able to grow their business because of implementing digital technologies. So what we see is the one that falls behind the curve, the companies that don't adopt digital transformation, uh, be, be slow to adopt it, have a tremendous impact on their business. So it's not the digital transformation that causing the worker uh, losing the job or having a different uh, life path, but it's the company strategy. Uh, whether they take digital transformation as their uh, future investment priority uh, will come with tremendous impact on the workers' uh, future. So this is uh, one particular area that's uh, not much addressed uh, by the government or by the uh, social supporting network. Uh, because I think it's more on a company-wide decision than on a social decision. And also, in terms of digital transformation, it's like 40 years ago we had the computers coming into the, uh, the society. And there will be more jobs, like the uh, microverse. Uh, Facebook has just creating a new area that will create, create a lot of new jobs. So people with the experience of their uh, daily life, uh, digital life, we will have more jobs compared to what we have uh, experienced in the manufacturing area. Uh, digital transformation will reduce uh, repetitive works, increase the manufacturing efficiency, so in the future people can be more flexible in their time and do more different jobs. So I'm very positive uh, as for where the workers will uh, so in the, in the future, even the manufacturers uh, doing more uh, automation, uh, they will have more choices and more uh, jobs to do in the future. Thanks, Michael. This uh, bring a bit different perspective. So, ninety percent company wants digital transformation, only ten percent doing that. And also, the earlier the company starting with that, actually, the better they can actually catch the opportunity. Basically, the business growth will compensate or you create more jobs there. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Peter. Yeah. I think yeah. uh, all the other speakers mentioned a lot about now the, is uh, the leadership changing the mind, mindset and uh, also having the right communication, the trainings. You are managing actually a lot of the group companies across Asia, OMIA group, and also interacting with other regions. How is your perspective here? Um, yeah, well, let's, let's put a bit for more from the practical side uh, what we do in the region. I said I'm running 14 countries in Asia Pacific. Uh, from New Zealand, Australia, up to India, Pakistan, North and Mongolia. Mongolia. Um, I'm going to exclude Australia and New Zealand. I think it's not relevant for our discussion today. Um, but uh, we have, we, we can, I think we can learn a lot from the history. Um, sometimes we ignore the history, but if you look at countries like Japan or Korea, um, and, and look in particular into Korea, what happened in Korea over the last 15 years? I mean, Korea was one of the poorest countries probably in the world, uh, comparable to Sudan today. And uh, look where they are today. It's a very sophisticated, developed country. Samsung, one of the leading companies in, in the chip manufacturing next to the Taiwanese. Um, and what happened? Did they suffer? Did the people suffer? No, I think, I think um, the Koreans have been working very hard. Um, they, they worked hard on the education as well. 
in if you look at the education career today, that the kids are really really suffering. Uh, they have um, after school a lot of tuition to get their skills up. Um, unfortunately, and you can see that throughout Asia, and Michael, maybe you you can can uh, agree to it or not, but uh, we still have a lot of repetitional kind of learning um, uh, exercises, uh, less innovative um, and less less creative um, learning um, and teaching like in the U.S. or in the Western countries. Um, of course, I mean, hard work, repet repetitive kind of, of uh, learning brings you to a certain level, okay? But uh, it stops at one stage at the level, at the management level, um, which is compensated in Asia and uh, very much in China with entrepreneurial skills. Unfortunately, en entrepreneurial skills, um, in particular in China, lead many times to um, creating uh, a less uh, competitive environment by just um, cutting prices and and um, and competing by price. And you can see in the past the uh, history over 30 years. I'm traveling more than 30 years in China. Um, every new innovation and product you bring to China is going to be killed after three to five years because one guy is driving a Mercedes, the next one wants to drive the same car. He's, he's making money with the product, so everybody's jumping on it, and and um, and um, overcapacity is created. Overcapacity leads to price and um, and and uh, at the end, the companies go down and the markets go down as well. So, so one one part is learning out of the history, um, but also looking at the development of countries, for example, uh, China. Um, at Omia, we we have a it's a Swiss technology, it's a Swiss company. I have both Swiss and German passports. You go into a country with high technology, okay? What happens if you go to China, you go to Vietnam, you go to Thailand with high technology? You're going to be beaten up, okay? Uh, automatization, um, high efficiency, digital. I, I can give an example. We run factories in in China or in in Thailand. With about 36 people or competitors, they need about 120 to 150. Okay, so well, you can imagine um, automatization on the other side is, is, is not there, all manual. But look at China um, the, the eastern part of China and the southern part of China, uh, the east coast, Shanghai, um, uh, Ningbo, Shandong province, going down to Guangzhou. Um, is, is, is developing over the last 10, 15 years incredibly. The labor, the labor cost in these areas are similar to like the European. You can, you can compare it probably even to some of the German areas uh, on, on, on salaries. And, and how did that happen? How did it happen? Um, manufacturing uh, were keeping up. Um, education kept up. Um, um, and and the cost was increasing of of, of housing, um, uh, lifestyle, um, and people were jumping from one place to the other. You get five percent more salary next door, they jump. Okay, so it's like of a jump up the ladder kind of uh, exercise. And I compare. I'm not comparing this with Korea in the in, in the past, but um, at the moment in Shanghai, you are not really competitive anymore. To other countries like Vietnam, okay. That's why the Chinese companies go now to Vietnam for manufacturing, okay. And I just acquired a big company in in Chengdu about two and a half years ago, and here in Chengdu you see still a big difference. And it's no wonder that the government is moving from the east more into the central areas of China to well offset some of the high cost uh, manufacturing and less competitive for for, for export. And compensated in the, in in the in the western part and outside of China, um, it will it will probably lead to a very similar situation in the future, like um, uh, wealth will will start, um, people will earn more money, and I'm actually not worried about the process of people getting lost on it. Um, it's it's a natural development. At the end, the companies will pay for it. Okay. The companies will pay for it, 
the question whether you're still competitive. Okay? And, and here, uh, if, if the, the governments and the people are not willing to educate their people properly, uh, train them, and here I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to Girish uh, on, on the training and skills and, and, and the education, it's the most important to start growing <coughs> the country uh, in, in, the, in the wealth path, and at the end the GDP will pay for it. Okay, you, you're going to be part of it with the GDP growth. Maybe you lose a little bit of cap competitiveness on one hand, but here maybe domestic markets like China, 1.4 billion, here is India, 1.4 billion, pe billion people. This is a huge market to play, right? So, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process, it's an evolution. You can call it evolution over years or decades. Uh, and um, wealth will start. Um, people have to move, be flexible, and, and get more educated or, or trained. If you don't have the education, they have to get trained to work with digitalization, to work <coughs> with automation machines, and so on. To come from the 120, 150 people to the OMIA standard of 36 at the end. Um, at the moment, we are in, in a good path. We see this trend going in a lot of countries which gives us, again, a competitive advantage. We, pay our, we can pay our people a little bit more. They're happy. They don't jump anymore. So, yeah. But I'm not worried. I'm very positive. I'm very positive that uh, Asia is going to grow very nicely and uh, not let any people behind. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. You shared a lot of the different aspects and also the insight from your own industry and the different countries. I think... Uh, it's all the sharing that I, this technology, the transformation process is inevitable. It's going to happen. At still, I think uh, we also shared a lot of now the disruptions, the impacts we see. Also mentioned some actually the roles from the companies, the governments. And then the question is now, who shall supplement yeah, the losses from those low-wage workers, their wages, and uh, also the disruptions? <laughs> I think probably it's not just a simple black and white answer. It's more complex. Um, Matthias, may we start with you again to share more of the perspective on that? Who, who should take the responsibility? Or what are actually the countermeasures? How we deal with that? Well, um, the first question is, what is the ecosystem that the companies are in? And then we have to start top down and try to be efficient and quick. Uh, there are different political systems around the world. And in this ecosystem, you need to have from regulator, you need to have a framework, a legal framework, what you're allowed to do. Now, putting that into perspective with the, what I always call the pandemic as a tsunami, so we have the first wave, the second, the third, the fourth, hopefully not the fifth and sixth and seventh. But we don't know when the water goes back what is left. So what we know for sure is that after, I think for decades, and it's, it's without any example before, when you look at how to run companies and how to include all the aspects of human capital, this will be a decisive factor because the way everybody talks about new work, but what does that mean? So it means the regulator needs to give you an environment that your workforce can be skilled. They have to work. You have to make your money. You have to get out of yes, yeah, negative numbers uh, after the pandemic. So you need to grow. So you need to do the day-to-day -day business, but you need to qualify at the same time. So this means the ecosystem is very important from a political standpoint and from the academic standpoint, or if you go to the low wages, also what the companies can do to help that the people get education. So regulatory framework, political system, how to do that, what you want, it's an agenda. Now, the company is part of this ecosystem. They can do certain things, but they are limited by other factors. Now to the question, who is gonna pay the bill? I'm unfortunately, a believer when we have take robotics more and more take digitalization more and more some of the workforce simply will be out of job bottom line and this will go to the welfare state when there is a welfare state 
There are certain countries in the world when you're out of job, you're simply at the street. So when you're out of job, the question is, is there a welfare system that the people are willing to support that? Now, when you look at big economies in the world, I mean, I don't want to go into details here, there are clear differences on how to do that. So it's a question of the social component that the state is willing to sacrifice for their people and not just going after the profits. So I'm a for-profit person, but I have to consider as a multiple entrepreneur why this is happening and how we can help maybe to smoothen that trend. But I think most of them are going to lose their jobs. Now, the question is how to reskill them. That's a different level. But I think one of the essential tools is also the mid-level management. They need to adapt. And now this comes to my initial statement of are they willing to and do they have the skills? And this has to do, again, when you go up the chain, what is the political agenda of a country where they want to be? What is Take Europe. We took a bold decision in the European Commission on how to transform Europe to a zero carbon in industry and all this. We just saw the results from, from Glasgow. So this will have tremendous impacts on supply chain, on the industry. And the question is the time frames, implementation, boldness of doing it with all the consequences of GDP and on forced labor. And all this together in a nutshell, what political agenda has the country? The economy, as Peter said, sacrifice of GDP. What do we want to do with our people as a social responsibility? And then consequently, in this ecosystem, what is the company, the CEO, able to do so that it doesn't go into any troubled waters or into any legal workforce or labor stuff? So really to understand what can I do? And then the question is, we have, will have now a new government in Germany, for example. They said they're going to increase the spending for education and also for long, uh, lifelong learning. We have an educational company. We just did a symposium at the Heidelberg, uh, Heidelberg Castle in Germany. And the topic was lifelong learning and impact on society, because that's exactly the key that we need. And not in the early stages, which is important. In the day-to-day -day what we have, the people are working and need to be skilled. That's the point. So lifelong learning, skill assessment, implementation. So it's the ecosystem, political will, and what the entrepreneur can do and what they are willing to do. That's the bottom line. Can, can I so, just make a comment on that, please, if, yeah. you, if you allow me? Very validly said, but let's put the developing Asian countries into, into perspective, okay? I don't think so. The governments here for several years or maybe decades will have the ability to provide the social security to the people, to the workforce. At the same time, disruptions are happening across the stream. Let's look at the sectors which are gaining way because of the new millennium, the young population. What are the sectors which are really bringing out opportunity in the manufacturing? Yes, auto sector. There is the infrastructure related so construction equipment sector. There is the uh, uh, the healthcare uh, in, uh, sector. So, you know, anything, there is the housing mm -hmm. sector. So wherever, because Asian economies are generally governed by young people and young people are demanding goods, I mean, whether it's textiles, home, uh, cars, automobiles, uh, cars, not just cars, but two wheelers, more automobiles, and they're going upscale in terms of the quality and in terms of things. What is equally happening, the global standards on safety has improved substantially. Then the safety standards, how do you keep up the manufacturing of the safety standards? There has to be precision. There can be no room for for errors. There can be no there can be absolutely zero tolerance for errors. So how does that happen? So Rotex is in. So that's exactly the point that I mentioned earlier today. A one million euro a dollar investment in in a, in a, in, a, in a manufacturing large company today produces 70 jobs or 80 jobs in India. The same number as 10 years ago was almost three times. So as the industry progresses to more automation, there is a lesser availability labor force. And this comes back to the point that I've been making, Matthias has been making, Peter has been making in terms of the education and the relevance of that. Now, I want to talk about one thing here. In our economies, in our world, even the government doesn't even have so much money to spend on vocational education. But let me give you the IT sector example in India. IT sector in India started as a body shop. 
today over the last 20 years it has really evolved itself last 25 years is also at the cutting edge delivering and developing technology in the cutting edge how has it happened it has not happened with the partly yes the employers have trained the people but most often the initiative has come from the people from the employees themselves they have, they have, up, they have got into the new applications re-educated themselves reskilled themselves there is no need to do a master's degree after pa passing out from Carnegie Mellon you work in an apple or you work wherever you keep on learning on the job and you're as good as a, as, as a master's educated person would be so actually, I think we need to inculcate the spirit of self-education as well in as much as the government should spend money in building a vocational infrastructure. Bottom line is it has to be a vocational infrastructure. Higher education, don't worry about it. We don't need to produce masters and PhDs. PhDs, yes, for academics, but we don't have to produce PhDs for, for, for R&D. But we don't need to produce PhDs for industry. We need to produce at the maximum undergrad engineering students more much more much 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 more at the cost of the vocational skills so why and this government has taken the first time we've tweaked the national education policy to gear ourselves to be in the right kind of a delivery pattern okay so after 10 stand a grade 10 a grade 12 you know you could go into higher advanced program so in equally the initiative should be and today with the with the advent of technology with the advent of apps availability today the self-learning is a doable proposition Today, the only thing that will be left is, is a resource sharing. How does a plumber learn how to fix the right kind of a plumbing machines? How does he learn to use that? Okay, yes, YouTubes, your videos, and all those technology changes are taking place. And India is way ahead in digitalization, way ahead in smartphone usage. So we have the critical mass. We have the technological base as a delivery mechanism for education to the poor people and to the poor workers who need to be trained as the technology is changed. So I think from disruption is there, is going to be there. And as disruption happens, we need to bring in into the more self-training systems, keep the entrepreneurs and the employers and the government aware of what kind of a program need to go. And then people will, will take over the thing and there will be dramatic change in the next 10, 15 years, you will see. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, it's, uh, I think you, Matthias, both mentioned uh, the mixed responsibility from government uh, to companies, but also lifelong learning, self-education, going to be uh, one of the key aspects in the future. We still have uh, just three minutes left. Maybe, Michael, can you just share also very quickly, one to two minutes, see you will anything you add on that? So I still then, in the end, want to hear something from Peter's side. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Just to uh, add a few uh, things here, the digital transformation actually reduced the time and space difference uh, among many things what we, have, what we have seen in the past. Uh, in China, the government encouraged entrepreneurship. Uh, Peter looking at uh, one angle, but the, the government continued uh, encouraged entrepreneurship among everybody, everyday citizens. And we have start to see the new economy bring products across the country, globe, without boundaries. Uh, people start doing pin door door, uh, online shopping, online um, merchandise. There are tremendous job opportunities. People can access the, uh, the Chinese market through the digital platform that had never happened before. So the entire market is open in front of the screen uh, to the Chinese people. So this is a different economy, different uh, perspective. So we see all level of governments in China encourage uh, give, giving uh, people support, uh, providing the guidance, education uh, for entrepreneurship, so people can pick up what they want to do uh, with the digital tools that are available to them. They can make payments through their WeChat account, they can set up uh, shops, they can do uh, many things. So this is very different. Um, but on the manufacturing side, it's become more and more efficient, uh, more and more automated. And that will also happen uh, at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, it's, uh, so, Peter, I think uh, you anything you you would like to add, we should very, very much like to hear also your perspective yeah, for the final two to three minutes. Mm. Yeah, I, I think we have a minute left. Um, mm. I think we haven't asked for any questions from the from the outside, but uh, I think when we combine what we heard from, from Matthias, uh, 
Gary and uh, also from Michael. Um, I, li I like very much what Gary said about the self-education part. And again, I repeat myself quickly in, in, in two seconds. Look at Korea, what happened? Dedication, hard work, um, support from, from the government somehow, but also from large um, companies to, to train, to are willing to train their people. And I think we will see the evolution in all those countries, India, China, and India with the digitalization, the very smart uh, IT people, uh, Chinese hardworking entrepreneurs, uh, they will make their life. And I'm, I'm, I doubt that too many people will go out of business as long they are they're willing, as long as they're willing to, to work hard. Um, and uh, just living for welfare, I think, um, yeah, it's the easiest one. But um, it, it all depends on how hungry the people are. And I know that Asian countries and Asian people are very hungry. They want to have their mobile phone. They want to have their car. They want to have whatever. And they will work hard for it. So I'm, I'm not worried. I think uh, we have a bright future here. Thank you, Peter. I think uh, yeah, time is unfortunately over now. We should we need actually much longer time for the discussion. Yeah. But thank you very much, everybody. And uh, it's been very, I think, uh, engaging to uh, enriching discussion. It has been also my great pleasure to meet all of you. I'm sure we're going to keep in touch also, yeah, even after the, the, the meeting. Okay? See you <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye